Section 1 of the History of the Art of Table Setting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The History of the Art of Table Setting by Claudia Quigley Murphy. Table Setting. Our social customs, as well as our language, are easily traceable to our Anglo-Saxon origin. From the days of King Arthur, that heroic monarch with his knights of legend and mystery, the round table has been a synonym for community of interest and adventure. Great as is the contrast in material things between the barbarism of these long-ago yesterdays and the luxuries of today, it is even less than the contrast between the manners and habits of the guests at the festive board. Unless we occasionally glance back at the successive steps leading to our modern environment, we cannot realize that, simple American citizens that we are, we are enjoying as everyday comfort a luxury in table setting and equipment unknown to the greatest monarch or the richest noble in the days of our not very remote ancestors. In all the illustrations of the Anglo Saxon period, the table setting included the salt cellar, which was the first thing put on the table. The salt was far more than the necessary condiment as we know it. It was in itself symbolic. To sit above the salt was to sit in a place of honour, and until the salt was put upon the table, no one could know where would be his allotted seat. Then came the silver dishes for holding vegetable or fish, sometimes meat, the round cross-marked articles being small loaves of bread, always present, the manche of early days. Occasionally, a knife is shown, and the prescribed rule was that it be well scoured. The spoons and knives were not furnished by the host, but were brought by guests whose servants, so equipped, cut the meat and carved the food for each person. The fair and bonny Queen Elizabeth was accustomed to lift to her mouth with her virgin fingers the second joint of the turkey and gnaw it to depletion. Careful rules were laid down for the carvers, where the officer of the mouth, or carver, is told... Set never on fish, flesh, beast, or fowl more than two fingers and a thumb. The guests had no plates or forks and few knives, but ate with their hands, and threw the refuse on the floors, which were usually stone, sometimes covered with rushes. Dogs and cats were freely invited to all feasts to serve a most useful purpose of gathering discarded food. In the Book of Courtesy, it is noted as very bad form to stroke the dog or cat availing itself of the general hospitality nor is the guest at the noble table to pick his teeth with his knife. The Cloth At that time, the cleanliness of the cloth, or nap, was of paramount importance and a matter of great pride. Generally speaking, the service on the tables was very simple, consisting of the silver bread basket for the notables, cups, sometimes stands for the dishes of meat and vegetables, called messes, brought by the cook, the knife and sometimes spoons for soup and liquid, and always a small round loaf of bread, or mansion. Hands were usually wiped on the sides of the tablecloth, for napkins were not in general use. Later came the silver ewer, or pitcher, and laver, or basin, presented by a servitor with towel on his arm, as shown in many old illustrations. Here the hands, and possibly lips, were cleansed from greasy contact of food, for there were no intervening forks in that period. The ceremony of using the ewer and laver, or basin, proceeded as well as followed the meal. The need for formal finger cleansing was imperative, as the food was served in messes or in trenchers, which were the common service for at least two, and frequently for four or more persons. So eating off the same plate in the days of Chaucer is more than a figure of speech. In the romance of Lancelot de Luc, a lady complains to her husband that she has not eaten off the same dish with her knight for several years. The niceties of table manners even then demanded that the hands which dipped into the common dish should be clean. That it was no easy thing to meet the requirements of table courtesy and eat daintily is shown by Chaucer in his picture of the prioress, the gentlewoman of his day, of whom he writes, There was also a nun, a prioress. At meat, well, I taught was she would hull. She let no morsel from her lips fall, no with her fingers in her sauce deep. Well could she carry a morsel, and well keep, that no drop fill upon her breast. Her overlip wiped she so clean, that in her cup was no furthing seen, of grease, when she drunk and had her draught, full seemly after her meat she wrought. While the nobility expressed its wealth in its silver trenchers, wassail bowls, ewers, lavers, basins, and other implements and tools of the table, 
the yeoman gloried in his pewter and the yokel contented himself with making a slice of black bread serve as trencher for his mess of meat and consuming it as part of the meal naturally the carving of the meat fowl or fish so that suitable portions could be served was a most important act essential to the progress of the meal and the comfort of the family or guest robert may in his book the accomplished cook which he published in sixteen sixty seven gives these terms of carving which are preceded by the invitation here's all the forms of every implement to work or carve with so he makes thee able to deck the dresser and adorn the table and so you're welcome pray fall to and eat break that deer leech that brawn rear that goose lift that swan sauce that capon spoil that hen fruff that chicken unbrace that mallard unlace that coney dismember that hern display that crane disfigure that peacock unjoint that bittern untach that curlew allay that pheasant wing that partridge wing that quail mince that plover thigh that pigeon border that pasty thigh that woodcock thigh all manner of small birds timber the fire tire that egg chine that salmon string that lamprey splat that pike sauce that place sauce that tench splay that bream side that haddock tusk that barbel culp on that trout fin that chevin trance in that eel tranch that sturgeon under tranch that porpoise tame that crab barb that lobster at banquets or suppers where desserts were most elaborate diagrams or explicit details were provided for the butler and other officers sometimes called sergeants and yeomen of the pantry the banquet of sweetmeats or kickshaws were disposed on silver dishes upon a central revolving machine or top made of wood of osier or willow for lightness the elaborateness and splendour of this arrangement was topped off with the epern on which large pyramids of fruit were placed carefully composed of peaches apples plums grapes and oranges the latter the especial delight of oliver cromwell whose wife joan rebukes him for his excessive fondness as unseemly and extravagant the whole was topped off with a glorious pineapple frequently rented for the occasion so the stories go and when a portion of pineapple was desired the tactful butler said the flavour of the peaches is choice and a portion of peaches was served so the pineapple passed intact to its next table the nef one of the most interesting of the ornaments of the table of that period was the nef or ship-like stretcher usually of silver sometimes of pewter which served to contain the salt cellar towel or napkin of its lordly owner it was usually topped off with its emblem in the illustration a bird is shown and it also carried the coat of arms the benches provided seating for the many chairs were for the great people so to sit on a chair was an event frequently the benches were boards on small trestles but not in use they were folded and stored in corners of the great hall so lived the people of merry england five or more centuries ago so they live to-day in other lands and we may safely assume that the rise in the scale of socialized living is definitely marked by its table-setting standards the lady of yesterday had to fulfil certain definite requirements there was little guesswork concerning her tasks these things were required of her she must have skill in household medication cereals their condition cookery its execution textiles their dressing hem flax wool spinning the process weaving the manipulation and choice of looms dairy work butter cheese etc distillation wines and simples baking care of bakehouse brewing care of brewhouse perfumes their preparation sewing and fabrication of clothing dyeing a knowledge of dye stuffs there is practically little mention of laundry in its work for the simple reason that there was little body linen or clothes to launder lingerie and night dresses coming into use many years after the period when the silken velvet or woolen gowns were soiled they were put into the dye pot an interesting story of the laying of queen elizabeth's table is englished by horace walpole from an old letter of a traveller of that period as follows a gentleman entered the room bearing a rod and along with him another who had a tablecloth which after they both had kneeled three times with the utmost veneration he spread upon the table and after kneeling again they both retired then came two others one with rod again the other a salt cellar a plate and bread when he had kneeled as the others had done and placed what was brought upon the table 
they two retired with the same ceremonies performed by the first at last came an unmarried lady said to be a countess and along with her came a married one bearing a tasting knife the former was dressed in white silk so when she had prostrated herself three times in a most graceful manner approached the table and rubbed the plates with bread and salt with as much care as if the queen had been present when they had waited there a little time the yeomen of the guard entered bareheaded clothed in scarlet with a golden rose upon their backs bringing in at each turn a course of twenty-four dishes served in plate these dishes were received by a gentleman in the same order they were brought and placed upon the table while the lady taster gave to each guard a mouthful to eat for fear of poison during the time that this guard which consisted of the tallest and stoutest men that could be found in all england being carefully selected for this service were bringing dinner twelve trumpets and two kettle drums made the hall ring for half an hour together at the end of all the ceremonial a number of unmarried ladies appeared who with particular solemnity lifted the meat off the table and conveyed it into the queen's inner and more private chamber when after she had chosen for herself the rest goes to the ladies of the court the queen sups and dines alone with very few attendants and it is very seldom that anybody foreigner or native is admitted at that time and then only at the intercession of somebody in power from Paul Hensner's Journey into England, printed at Strawberry Hill by Horace Walpole, 1717 to 1797. The story of the entry on the stage of domestic life of the various implements of tableware is a record of the advance in gentler living. Table manners became a matter of convention as well as a fact, showing definite progress in fastidious habits at the table. In Lady Rich's Closet, 1633, discussing the paper frill around the bony end of the leg of mutton which had already made its appearance the lady was admonished to adopt a convenient instrument at the risk of being called over dainty in carving she was told to distribute the best pieces first and that it is decent to use a fork it was at about this period that women began to officiate at the head of the table in the useful task of carvers and distributors of the meat which was passed out on a broad flat knife sometimes as much as four inches in width though this new duty brought with it the honour of promotion to a high place above the salt they were really repeating their old task as distributors of the bread as in earlier days careful instruction in carving and serving meats was given by teachers and professors in the gentle art of etiquette among the points of behaviour to be observed at the table were these to sit straight at table nor by ravenous gesture discover a voracious appetite talk not when you have meat in your mouth nor venture to eat spoon meat so hot as to bring tears to your eyes which is unseemly the hallmark of the graces of yesterday is found in the silver which has come down to the fortunate ones of today possible it is that this evidence of their genial living happy thinking is but the tangible heritage of the days gone by and by the same evidence shall we be judged by our descendants shall we leave them pewter brass or the honoured and honourable silver the queen of table metals there was something more in the development of table service than convenience or utility for in this process came handsomer living and nicer and finer service no longer did we feed as ravening wolves or hungry animals but rather as humans of greater refinement the literature of the seventeenth century is redolent of good living and choice service samuel pepys our much-loved diarist of that period tells of his dinings at which we were merry when careful cooking and fine living were more than a theory rather an outward evidence of an inward desire for a more satisfactory rendering of culinary art silver has served a very definite use in this portrayal of home life and manners of the robust ages that precede us for silver definitely marked the advance in riches of the individual as well as of the nation and in the seventeenth century they certainly set great store or value on silver remember pepys disappointment at the christening when he had provided six spoons and some plate against the child being named for him and the minister in christening pronounced the child's name john and samuel pepys carried his silver spoons and plate home again back in the sixteenth century we read that henry the eighth paid one pound six shillings eight pence for carving knives and that mistress brent in fifteen hundred received twelve shillings for a silver fork weighing three ounces a matter of very careful record boiled and fried meats came to the table on silver and the roasts on spits as they were lifted from the fire 
vegetables were also dressed in silver dishes and as time progressed more and more articles of table service were fashioned from silver social life was progressing merrily in the sixteenth century husband and wife ate from the same dish as evidence of their faithfulness and love possibly the loving cup is also a relic of that day men and women alternated at table and the social graces developed and the amenities of life increased with the handsomer service came courtesy and kindliness table manners table setting and table equipment progressed rapidly from the reign of henry the eighth who started the movement for more luxurious living to the period in which his daughter elizabeth held sway so symbolic was it that shakespeare makes one of his women characters reproach her husband with the fact that she had not dipped fingers in the dish with him for many months then came the picture of queen elizabeth conferring the degree of knighthood on the loin of beef the ceremony of which is described in the knighting of sirloin the knighting of sirloin elizabeth tudor her breakfast would make on a pot of strong beer and a pound of beef steak ere six in the morning was told by the chimes oh the days of queen bess they were merry old times from hawking and hunting she rode back to town in time just to knock an ambassador down toyed trifled coquetted then lopped off a head and at three score and ten danced a hornpipe to bed with nicholas bacon her counsellor chief one day she was dining on english roast beef that very same day when her majesty's grace had given lord essex a slap in the face my lord keeper stared as the wine cup she kissed at his sovereign lady's superlative twist and though thinking truly his larder would squeak he'd much rather keep her a day than a week what you call this dainty my very good lord the loin bowing low till his nose touched the board and breath of our nostrils and light of our eyes saving your presence the ox was a prize unsheath me mine host thy toledo so bright delicious sirloin i do dub thee a knight be thine at our banquets of honour the post while the queen rules the realm let sirloin rule the roast anonymous spoons were the table utensil they were not provided by the host but each guest produced from his pocket his own spoon to use during his visit were that for a meal or a month these spoons usually of elaborate design were often gifts of one of the sponsors at baptism chief among favourite designs for these spoons was the well-known apostle spoon a rich child with wealthy godparents would probably receive all twelve of the apostles the more humble one or two poor folks must carry their own spoons as well as the rich but theirs were usually of tinned iron and were called latin spoons it is easily seen how our still existing saying born with a silver spoon in his mouth originated it meant more than wealth for possessors of a silver spoon sat during the medieval times at the table on the days later they sat above the dividing line of the general table always marked by the elaborate standard of all high above the salt lower down came those who were endowed only with the latin spoon and least of all very far from the honour conferring salt were placed those who were armed with spoons of wood forks forks came later and their introduction produced much criticism the objectors holding that fingers were made before forks was not to be gainsaid but as usual progress marched forward with precision and decision forks came from italy and thomas coriat's letters of sixteen o eight cites the new discovery as almost as important as the discovery of america and causes far more discussion Coriat writes, the Italians, as well as strangers in Italy, do always eat their meals use a little fork when they cut their meat. It was bad form to put the fingers to the meat dish, and worse manners, which gave offence to all the company, to carry the meat from the plate or dish with the fingers. The forks were of iron or steel, and some silver ones, these being used only by gentlemen. Queen Elizabeth had at least three forks, one of crystal garnished with gold and sparks of garnets, another of coral slightly garnished with gold and a third of gold garnished with two little rubies two little pearls pendant and a coral but they could only have been meant as curios they were not meant for eating the michaelmas goose of which she was so fond to coriat belongs the honour of first laying the forks on the table and though the pulpit denounced and the public raged forks had come to stay in 1652, Halen alludes to the use of silver forks, and in the days of Charles II, forks were in common use. 
They were usually of steel, sometimes of two prongs, occasionally of six. The handles were of many materials and scores of shapes. Some had green, some pink, and some yellow handles, but the silver fork was rare till the beginning of the 19th century. The fork did much for the simplification and advancement of culinary art by encouraging the taste for solid viands and natural flavours. The use of the fork made possible the delicate slice as against the gobbets of meat of the century before, and also the fork promotes cleanliness at the table in contrast with the messy days when fingers were used in the bowls. The introduction of the fork also made possible choicer table linen, finer cloths and handsome napkins. There soon developed definite rules for folding and laying the napkin, so that there was published diagram showing 25 ways to fold the napkin. Knives, forks and spoons, platters, ewers and basins, being introduced and accounted for, the custom of a more dignified setting of table became popular. With the improvement of table appliances, manners improved and culinary art advanced to higher standards, the better to fit the richer and more elaborate table setting and silver service. The program of the social amenities began to develop in the time of Queen Anne, who was an adept in culinary art and a devotee of gastronomic delights. The men and women of that period were good stout trencher folk, and life was expressed in good eating. In this period, a more attractive and more stately service for meals was developed. Silversmiths were set at work to achieve higher standards of art and metalwork, and royalty gave the sign for higher standards of living and more delicate methods of eating. Before forks came into use, it was the duty of the carver who stood near the table to cut the slices of meat in a gobbet, then slit the slice in four almost to the top, so that it could more daintily be bitten and more conveniently masticated. Coriat, in his interesting letters from Italy, describes the use of forks. He writes, For while with their knife, which they hold in one hand, they cut the meat out of the dish, they fasten their fork, which they hold in their other hand upon the same dish, so that whatsoever he be, that sitting in the company of any others at meal, should unadvisedly touch the dish of meat with his fingers, from which all at the table do cut, he will give occasion of offence unto the company, as having transgressed the laws of good manners, insomuch that for his error he shall be at least brow-beaten, if not reprehended in words. Hereupon I myself thought good to imitate the Italian fashion, not only when I was in Italy, but in England since I came home. Large platters appeared for holding the generous roast, and the gaily ornamented fowl, and the service of fish was highly decorated. Queen Anne, with her friend Sarah Jennings, first Duchess of Marlborough, did much to develop the amenities of dining. It was a gay age, for wealth was increasing rapidly from the American colonies, as well as from other sources. Table silver, then as now, was the evidence of its presence and the expression of the good taste and fine judgment of their possessor. The choicest heirlooms of today are the fine tableware of silver of that and succeeding periods, and from that period date our present standards of good living and its culinary art. The succeeding Georgian period, including George I, II, III, and IV, gave much indignified table service to the present time, and examples of it are much sought for. The scene of silver-making activities now shifts from the merry England of the four Georges to the bleak American shores, for here was made, even in the earliest days, silver tableware of excellent design in correct form. Many of our pieces of early colonial design and fabrication have been unjustly credited to British origin and English design, on the presumption that their high quality of craftsmanship could not have been produced in America at that early date. Silversmithing is an early American art. There was a silversmith named Thomas Howard, registered in Jamestown, Virginia, in his 1620 arrivals, and in 1634, John Mansfield was a silversmith working in Charleston, Massachusetts. In the period from 1650 to 1730, some excellent work was produced, and silver spoons with trifid handles, monograms on back, are still in existence. There were domed and globular teapots, or fat and thin, as they were frequently described. There were, of course, tankards, beakers and cups, and always very good salt cellars, the salt cellar still holding its favourite place on the table. Also, there were interesting and now obsolete pieces, the potato ring and the muffineer. The potato ring was a ring of pierced and wrought silver, large enough to encircle a moderate-sized platter and hold in place a good mound of baked or boiled potatoes. The muffineer may be called the progenitor of our salt shakers, except that it was intended for sugar and not salt. 
From 1730 to 1765, the designs for spoons were more varied, the most common design being the one described as rat tail. With the advent of Paul Revere into the art of silversmithing came a broadening of design, for the Revere designs include scroll embellishments such as cockle shells, sometimes birds. The front of the handle was decorated, and a more artistic effect secured. More kinds of spoons were made, such as salt spoons and marrow spoons with their usual bowl and the handle drawn into a long, narrow scoop. The first forks made here were done by John Noyes of Boston, 1674 to 1749, and are now in the Boston Museum. They have silver handles and steel prongs. Knives were occasionally made with silver handles, but they were rare, most of them having bone grasps, so much for early flatware. Porringers of silver were in early use and bear the somewhat earliest dates of all hollow tableware. Teapots, coffee pots, cups, tureens, sugar bowls, and platters, as well as silver patch boxes to carry the ever present piecework of the day, followed as the wealth of the colonies increased and their living grew more comfortable. Silver expressed best the choicer family pride and gave evidence of richer family traditions. While New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and other places produced choice silver and other wares, the center of the industry has always been in New England. In the list of the early silversmiths, we find Jabez Gorham, recorded as a silversmith in Providence, Rhode Island, in 1792, and in 1820, John Gorham was entered as a silversmith. Then, in New Haven, Connecticut, Miles Gorham antedated both, for he is of definite record as a silversmith, with the dates of 1757 to 1847, a period of 90 years. Small wonder that our best traditions of silver lie with the house of the Gorham Associates, who so splendidly carry forward the traditions and examples of the earliest members of the house. End of section 1section two of the history of the art of table setting this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phone the history of the art of table setting by claudia quigley murphy the well-dressed table linens for breakfast luncheon and dinner the two informal meals of breakfast and luncheon give scope for variety in table setting and use of colour in the linen. Over the bare table oblong mats and runners of crash or linen, white or coloured, may be effectively used, with small napkins to match. The luncheon table will be a trifle more elaborate than that of breakfast. The mats and runners will be white instead of coloured, and the napkins with them of the conventional luncheon size, that is, 14 to 17 inches square. If a formal luncheon is served, a lace or embroidery trimmed cloth which follows the shape of the table is often used. Napkins of the conventional luncheon size will, in this case, be decorated to match the cloth used. Exquisite cloths of this description can be obtained. At dinner, the heavy damask cloth is preferred. It is usually unadorned save for the pattern in the linen itself or by one handsome monogram. The dinner cloth, to be quite correct, should always be rectangular, never round, no matter what the shape of the table. Dinner napkins are also of heavy damask, 26 to 36 inches square. Whenever a tablecloth is used, it should be laid over a silence cloth of white, thick, double-faced material. This silence cloth should extend 5 inches over each side of the table. Linens may be omitted entirely, if desired. There is nothing more beautiful and correct than a silver service laid directly on the bare surface of a beautifully polished wood. Laying the table First of all, the table should be adjusted so that each person to be served will have at least 25 inches space for service. If the table is being set for breakfast or an informal luncheon, the mats or runners are carefully arranged on the bare table, or if desired, a low centerpiece on a center mat is arranged. Good taste demands something very simple, a bowl of flowers or fruit, and should by all means be low enough so as in no way to cut off one side of the table from the other, thus impeding general conversation. In preparing the table for dinner, the silence cloth should first be laid, then the tablecloth, straight and smooth, with lengthwise fold in the exact center. Mathematical precision is the rule in regard to the laying of silver. It should be laid one half inch in from the edge of the table, 
very compactly and neatly, knives with cutting edges toward the plate, and spoons in general being laid to the right of the cover, forks on the left, arranged in the order in which they are to be used, the one first to be used being farthest from the plate. One exception to the general rule occurs when oysters are the first course to be served at a luncheon or dinner. If the oyster fork is supplied with the rest of the silver at the cover, it may take its place at the extreme right of the cover, just before the spoons and knives. The matter of supplying silver for all the courses when the cover is laid is optional. It may be brought in with the courses as they are served, if preferred. In the absence of a waitress, it saves confusion to have the silver all laid and ready. The napkin, neatly folded, is placed to the right of the cover, one half inch from the edge of the table, with hemmed edge uppermost, and if folded squarely, the hemmed edge should be parallel to both the edges of the table and to the cover. Glasses are placed just above the knives and slightly to the right. Just before the meal is announced, they should be filled three quarters full. Bread and butter are not usually served at the formal dinner, but are often desired for the informal or family dinner. When they are to be served, bread and butter plates are placed at the upper left-hand side of the cover, at the tip of the forks. Butter spreaders are laid across the bread and butter plates. Butter is supplied on each bread and butter plate, just before the meal is announced. Salt and pepper may be supplied individually, in which case they occupy a place just in front of each cover, or they may be placed between each two covers, or nearing the corners of the table, just on a line with the top edge of the plate. Chairs should be placed at each cover, but should not touch the table itself. General Service The meal should be announced quietly, either by the waitress, a daughter of a family who will act in the capacity of waitress, or by the hostess herself. In case a waitress or daughter of the family makes the announcement, she speaks only to the hostess, who in turn indicates to the guest that all is in readiness. For informal family service, when there is no waitress, a member of the family may quietly leave the table when it is time to attend to details of removing a course and bringing on a new one, or supplying water, butter, and so forth. The tea wagon may be used informally by the hostess for such meals as breakfast and luncheon. It may stand at her right, and may have upon it the dishes for the courses which follow. In this case, the hostess removes to the tea wagon all the large dishes or platters of food. These will be followed by the used plates and silver, and the table being thus cleared of one course, the guests will be served from the tea wagon with plates and silver required for the next. If thought is expended on this type of service, it may be accomplished very smoothly and efficiently, and no one will have to leave the table. However, everything must be in readiness before the meal begins, and no detail forgotten. When service is to be given by a waitress or some member of the family, there are a few simple rules to remember. Everything except beverages should be served and removed from the left of a guest. In offering a dish of food, be sure its spoon and fork are convenient to the person being served, and offer such dishes at the left of a guest and when removing plates, etc. Never reach across a cover. Beverages are served from the right. Glasses, cups, and saucers are removed from the right. Serve the hostess, then the guest of honor, who will be seated at the right of the hostess, then the guest next at the right of the host, and so on until all are served. The host is usually served last. When changing a course, everything that will not be required by a later course should be removed. Large dishes containing food should be removed first, then soiled silver, china, and glass. If there is any unused silver, china, or glassware, remove it next and follow this, if necessary, by removing crumbs from the table with a small plate and a clean folded napkin. When the waitress, in informal service, wishes to remove a course as quickly as possible, she may take one dish with her left hand, transfer it to her right, and remove another with her left, thus going away with both hands full, and, if possible, leaving the cover entirely cleared, a highly desirable result. As soon as one course has been entirely removed, the waitress should place the silver for the next course, if it has not previously been placed at each cover. After she has supplied each guest with the following course, she should not resume her seat or retire until she has filled the water classes and, if necessary, supplied bread and butter. A plate containing bread and one containing butter balls with butter fork, as well as a carafe containing water, should be upon the serving table for the convenience of the waitress. Late Supper 
the crowning touch to the theatre party or the returning guests from the dinner dance is a tasty bit of supper which enhances the lingering memory of the evening's entertainment at this feast no servant enters the chafing dish serves as stove the host or hostess serves as chef the fortunate guests as servers and mirth presides be the menu a simple rare bit or a more complex chicken a la king the table setting is simple as outlined and then let joy be unconfined the chafing dish set at a convenient place is the focal centre of the snack for such it is to the fortunate guest the bread thinly sliced and folded in a napkin adjoins the electric toaster the silver dish for the tasty rarebit shines with lustre of true silver end of section two recording by phone section three of the history of the art of table setting this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the history of the art of table setting by claudia quigley murphy chapter three details of breakfast service the service of fruits little details of serving food are after all the things which make or mar an otherwise perfect meal even breakfast can be so daintily and deftly served that to partake of it becomes a real event and source of satisfaction what are the correct methods of serving fruits an apple should either be served on a plate about six inches in diameter and accompanied by a silver fruit knife so that the guest may cut it into quarters and peel it at his pleasure or the fruit plate and knife may be brought to the table first and laid in front of the guest and then a fruit dish with apples may be passed by the waitress other fruits served in the same way as apples are pears plums apricots and mandarins fresh berries strawberries blackberries blueberries raspberries as well as currants baked apples stewed prunes stewed peaches apricots and all cooked fruits are served in sauce dishes which rest upon small service plates and should be accompanied by a fruit spoon unless the table has been laid with all the silver which will be needed with all soft fruit served in this way the waitress should pass fine granulated or powdered sugar and cream when there is no waitress these may be passed at the table strawberries when very large are sometimes served with the stems left on in which case they should be on plates of the same size as those used for apples and should be accompanied by a spoonful of powdered sugar on the side of the plate peaches may be served whole in the same way as apples or they may be peeled and sliced and served as berries or other soft fruits are served nectarines a variety of peach with soft skin may be served in the same way as peaches they are usually served whole to serve grapes each person is supplied by the waitress with a fruit plate then a compote containing the grapes accompanied by grape shears is passed by the waitress who cuts the bunches for each person as desired grapes may also be served individually in clear glass bowls with iced water cherries are served from a compote in the same way as grapes each guest having been supplied with fruit plate and finger bowl one half of a large grapefruit is usually served to one person it is carefully prepared with tough center removed and may have had sugar previously added if desired it should come on a fruit plate or in a special grapefruit bowl with small service plate underneath accompanied by an orange spoon the waitress should see that more sugar is supplied to those desiring it oranges may be served in a variety of ways they may be served from the compote each guest having a fruit plate fruit knife and fruit spoon in this case sugar should be passed by the waitress as soon as the guests have cut their oranges and are ready a very usual way of serving this fruit is to cut it in half and serve on fruit plate with orange spoon in this case the waitress passes the sugar to each person if a sliced orange be served having been peeled also on a fruit plate then it may be eaten with a fork but if served whole or halved in a dish such as used for berries 
an orange spoon is used. Cantaloupe, filled with cracked ice, is served in halves or quarters on fruit plates, or in a special fruit dish such as is sometimes used for grapefruit, and should be accompanied by a fruit spoon. Sugar, salt, and pepper are supplied by the waitress. Honeydew melon is served in the same way as cantaloupe and is usually accompanied by a slice of lemon. Watermelon is cut in wedges or circles and is served on a fruit plate larger than the usual fruit plate, and a fruit knife as well as fork may be provided. The finger bowl plays an important part in the serving of most fruits. Indeed, it is indispensable except when berries or sliced fruits are served. In the absence of a waitress, fruit may be served individually at each cover before the members of the family and guests are seated. The service of cereals. Hot things hot is a good rule to remember when serving cooked cereals, such as rolled oats, cracked wheat, cornmeal mush, and hominy grits. These may come from the kitchen served in individual bowls on service plates and accompanied by a spoon, unless sufficient silver for all the courses has previously been laid at each cover. The waitress offers sugar and cream to each person, or these may be passed at the table in the absence of a waitress. Many persons prefer brown sugar served with these cooked cereals. Cereals may also be served by the host from a porringer, a large serving spoon being used. Individual cereal bowls are brought to him, and as he serves each of these, the waitress carries it to the guest. If there is no waitress, these may be passed from the head of the table as each bowl is served. Ready-cooked dried cereals are served in the same way, following in addition any special directions which may be on the box containing the cereal. The invariable rule should be to reheat but not brown the ready-to-eat flakes or the puffed grains. This treatment will give them the desired crispness which always enhances the flavor. The service of toast and hot cakes. Toast as needed is best made at the table with an electric toaster. If toast, French toast, hot cakes, or waffles are brought from the kitchen, have the plate containing them covered with a perforated silver cover. Do not cover it with a soup plate or bowl. This makes toast soggy. The very convenient and attractive toast rack or a silver bread tray is frequently used for dry toast. When waffles, hot cakes, or French toast are served, the syrup should not be forgotten. Also, a dish containing a mixture of pulverized sugar and cinnamon might be provided, as some prefer this to the syrup. Service of eggs, cooked in shell, coddled, or boiled. Serve medium and soft-cooked eggs, either an egg cup or egg glass with six-inch plate under cup or glass. Eggs served in this way may come directly from the kitchen as individual service. Each one should be accompanied by silver egg cutter and also by a spoon, unless sufficient silver has been laid at the cover. Hard-boiled eggs may be served in vegetable dishes or on small plates. If the vegetable dish is used, it should have a six-inch plate under it. Each person being served should already have been supplied with large service plate, so that the six-inch plate containing the egg cup or other dish may be set at the upper left of each cover. Eggs poached on toast. A small platter containing individual portion is set just above each serving plate. Serving spoon should be provided. Sheared eggs. Serve in individual sheared egg dishes, set upon small plates and set to the left of each cover. The guests should previously have been supplied with a service plate. Scrambled eggs. Serve individual portion on small platter just above each service plate and supply spoon to each guest, or serve on larger platter placing before host. In this case, have all the service plates also before the host, or the waitress may bring them to him one or two at a time. Large spoon for serving will be required. Waitress may pass individual portions as served, or they may be passed at the table from guest to guest. Omelette. Serve large size omelet on large platter. Have all service plates hot when placed before the host, or the waitress may bring him one or two at a time. A serving spoon and serving fork to be used in separating the portions of the omelet will be required. 
the waitress may pass the individual portions as they are served or as is customary with scrambled eggs they may be passed at the table from host to guest the rasher of bacon to the american trained in the food lore of the anglo-saxons a breakfast without its rasher of bacon ushers in a day foredoomed to disappointments the crisp curled slices brown to a delectable hue served on the hot shining silver platter will change the most taciturn to a happy smiling vis-a-vis -vis. the loaf giver the revival of the use of the decorated breadboard with its silver bread knife with which the thin slices are cut and placed on the electric toaster is a return to the charming personal service when the lady was in truth the loaf giver the dispenser of the staff of life to all who came to her castle door it means the adapting of the present lack of home service so that the resulting good makes for the fine courtesy of personal service the give and take between equals child service at those meals at which either the children of the household or visitors children appear at table it is well to provide for them the regular child service attractive little knives and forks as well as spoons and pushers are now made especially for the use of these small folk it is wise also to have at the child's place a tray which is so designed as to fit along the edge of the table and of sufficient size to hold most of the things used during the meal the value of correct table service for children cannot be overestimated for not only does the child enjoy having his own porringer mug and small pitcher containing his milk as well as the small size flat silver but having the proper utensils and tools aid in teaching him to be independent and neat at table unless a fresh napkin be provided for each meal a small silver marker bearing the child's own monogram should be provided for his napkin and the clasps for holding the napkin in place during the meal should accompany it end of section three Section 4 of The History of the Art of Table Setting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The History of the Art of Table Setting by Claudia Quigley Murphy. Chapter 4 Details of Luncheon and Dinner Service. Service of Fruit Cocktails. These are served in cocktail glasses set upon small plates and a spoon should either accompany each laid on the plate at the side of the cocktail glass or should have been placed at the extreme right of the cover when the table was laid just before the meal is announced these may be placed one at each cover or they may be served after the guests are seated service of oysters and clams oysters or clams as appetizers are served in the half shell on a bed of cracked ice a deep plate being used for the purpose. This is usually set upon a somewhat larger plate in order to protect the table should the ice melt and overflow. They are accompanied by an oyster fork unless this has been laid previously at the extreme right of the cover. One-fourth of a lemon should be laid in the center of each plate. Sometimes, however, oysters appear as cocktails and are then dressed with sauce and served in a cocktail glass set upon a small plate accompanied by an oyster fork oysters or clams on the half shell may be placed at each cover before the meal is announced but it is a little better to serve them just after the guests are seated service of soups should the meal begin with soup the table should be laid so that a large service plate is at each cover with soup spoons at the extreme right of the cover the napkin should be placed on the service plate monogram uppermost the dinner roll may be slipped in its folds when these have been removed the waitress places upon each service plate a smaller deeper plate containing soup when the soup is finished the waitress removes both soup and service plate service of fish and meat platters of fish or meat can be so prepared in the kitchen that the guests at table may serve themselves from a dish passed by the waitress this is always true in service a la russe if desired the host may carve the meat at the table 
the waitress standing beside him at his left ready to take each plate as it is filled from the left with her right hand taking it to the guest and returning to stand beside the carver all the plates may be placed before the carver at once or the waitress may bring a fresh plate each time from the side table when the number to be served is over four the latter is better in case some member of the family has acted as waitress in bringing to the host the meat for service she may return to her place and the plates as filled may be passed from one to another by those seated at the table service of vegetables it will usually be found best to have the waitress pass the vegetables to each guest allowing him to help himself with large serving spoon and fork she should offer such dishes from the left placing the serving spoon and fork convenient to the guest and using a folded napkin beneath the dish the double service silver vegetable dish is excellent for vegetables served in this way in informal family service where a member of the family has acted as waitress these vegetables may be served by the host with the meat course or another member of the family seated at his right may assist him by serving vegetables on the plate which he has supplied with meat service of salads everything used in making a salad should be cold and crisp even the plates on which it is to be served should be chilled a warm salad is an abomination individual salads should be served on eight inch plates and may be accompanied by wafers crisp butter crackers or sandwiches crackers wafers or sandwiches may be passed by the waitress after the salad is served with the crackers or wafers cream cheese may also be served bar le duc guava jelly or strawberry jam may be passed with salads that are dressed with french dressing if there is to be a salad salad fork should be provided in laying the cover salad usually comes as a separate course after the meat and vegetables at a luncheon it may be the main course if the salad is to be dressed at the table the waitress places before the host the chilled individual salad plates a bowl containing the ingredients chilled for the salad silver stands containing salt pepper and paprika shakers a peppercorn grinder a bottle of worcestershire sauce a vinegar cruet an olive oil cruet and the mustard jar and silver spoon the waitress should also provide the hostess with silver handled olive wood tined and bowled salad fork and spoon a separate bowl may be used for mixing the dressing the oil is poured first and the seasonings added then it is thinned with vinegar which may be tarragon or estragon vinegar as preferred the epicure who is exacting in his taste will demand that the bowl be first rubbed with the cut surface of a clove of garlic thus giving to the dressing the accent necessary to successful flavoring the dressing made in this way is then poured upon the salad and the whole tossed lightly for a few seconds before serving another way of preparing the dressing is to hold the salad spoon over the bowl containing the ingredients for the salad put into it the salt and pepper and other seasonings then fill the spoon with oil mix with a fork and pour upon the salad distributing well then add the rest of the oil a spoonful at a time tossing the salad lightly after each addition lastly add the vinegar toss again and serve it is perfectly correct to serve the salad without dressing thus giving to each guest the privilege of taking more or less of the dressing as desired in this case either the french or the mayonnaise dressing is served in a silver bowl on its tray with the salad spoon beside it the waitress serving to the left of the guest who helps himself in the absence of the waitress the hostess passes the salad dressing to the guest of honor who after helping himself passes it on to the next guest at his right a salad to make this condiment your poet begs the pounded yellow of two hard-boiled eggs two boiled potatoes passed through kitchen sieve smoothness and softness to the salad give let onion atoms lurk within the bowl and half suspected animate the whole of mordant mustard at a single spoon distrust the condiment that bites so soon but deem it not thou man of herbs a fault to add a double quantity of salt and lastly o'er the flavoured compound toss 
a magic soup spoon of anchovy sauce oh green and glorious oh herbaceous treat to attempt the dying anchorite to eat back to the world he'd turn his fleeting soul and plunge his fingers in the salad bowl serenely full the epicure would say fate cannot harm me i have dined to-day sydney smith service of bread and butter when bread and butter are to be served a bread and butter plate is provided and takes its place at the upper left of the cover individual butter spreaders are placed on these plates just before the meal pats of butter should be distributed and the waitress replenishes these as the meal progresses placing a dinner roll in the folds of the napkin either upon the plate or when the napkin lies to one side of the plate is a convenient method of supplying the guests with bread at the beginning of a meal and the waitress or member of the family acting as such may pass rolls or other bread from time to time service of desserts before the dessert is served all the other dishes are removed from the table and the waitress or member of the family acting in that capacity brushes the crumbs from the table using a folded napkin and a plate silver for dessert will probably have been laid with the cover when the table was set but the silver to be used will depend largely on what the dessert is to be for ice cream particularly the brick ice cream the ice cream spoon with prongs should be used at formal luncheons and dinners it is good form as the salad service is removed to place before each guest a dainty or elaborate glass or silver finger bowl and plate under the finger bowl and on the plate rests a filmy linen or lace doily which each guest removes with the finger bowl placing both to the left above the plate upon this plate the dessert may be served or it may be removed as the dessert on its own plate is placed in front of the guest later the finger bowl is placed in front of the guest or the guest himself removes it to a convenient place where the tips of the fingers which may have touched food are gently dipped in the water and dried daintily on the napkin a subtle reminder to the initiate that while we have advanced far we still retain the form of bowl laver and towel of the pre-forkless age in less formal dinners the sweet dessert may be omitted and the cheese hard crackers or toasted wafers and coffee substituted service of cheese cheese is often served at the end of a meal american cheese vermont sage cheese waukesha cream cheese schweitzer cheese and fromage de brie are served on individual small plates with doilies and accompanied in each case by a cheese knife and crackers neufchatel camembert and roquefort as well as sapsago cheese are served a small wedge to each person on small plates with butter and accompanied by a butter knife edam and pineapple cheese should be served from a large dish some of the cheese should be cut and accompanied by a cheese knife and a plate of crackers each guest will help himself it is also proper to serve edam cheese from a cheese stand with a cheese knife who can live without dining we may live without poetry music and art we may live without conscience and live without heart we may live without friends we may live without books but civilized man cannot live without cooks we may live without books what is knowledge but grieving we may live without hope what is hope but deceiving we may live without love what is passion but pining but where is the man who can live without dining owen meredith coffee for breakfast and luncheon coffee for breakfast or luncheon may be made on the table with an electric percolator if desired and in any case it may be poured by the hostess the waitress will take each cup as it is filled to a guest in the absence of a waitress these may be passed at the table when coffee is poured by the hostess at the table she frequently adds cream and sugar also after ascertaining the wishes of the guest for whom she is preparing the cup of coffee ordinarily the teaspoons necessary for service of coffee and tea will be supplied in laying the cover but if necessary they can be laid on the saucers as the cups are taken or passed to the individual guest the demitasse 
with after-dinner coffee the waitress should pass loaf sugar with silver tongs and if the guests desire it cream also should be offered though after-dinner coffee is supposed to be taken black if it is desired the demitasse may be served with the cheese and crackers after dinner coffee may be served in the drawing-room the waitress passing the cups on a tray each guest helping himself smoking service after the formal dinner when the ladies have retired to the drawing-room cigars and cigarettes are offered to the gentlemen these may be brought to table in the cedar lined silver boxes which accompany many smoking sets the feast now done discourses are renewed and witty arguments with mirth pursued the cheerful master mid his jovial friends his glass to their best wishes recommends the grace cup follows to his sovereign's health and to his country plenty peace and wealth performing then the piety of grace each man that pleases reassumes his place dr king the art of cookery london seventeen forty how to serve afternoon tea tea service is rapidly becoming a factor around which our social and domestic life revolves tea gives an opportunity for the exercise of a hospitality that adds grace to our everyday life and the tea table becomes the synonym for simple and agreeable entertaining the tea wagon or table with its service of silver the glistening kettle the attractive cups the dainty service of small cakes or brown crisp toast either cinnamon spread or simply and daintily buttered the tempting little sandwich all add to the delight and pleasure of the group the rules for the service of tea are few formality is absent the pleasure great good cheer and friendliness the outcome a hostess usually asks some of her friends to assist her by pouring tea service for which is at one end of a long table this service should consist of a regular silver tea service with china cups and plates napkins etc when tea is poured sugar or lemon is added according to the preference of the person served a teaspoon is placed upon the saucer beside the cup of tea two or three silver trays should be upon the table each containing sugar sugar tongs cream and dish with silver inset containing slices of lemon sandwiches and cakes are passed by friends of the hostess it is the duty of the waitress or some member of the family acting as such to remove the cups and spoons bringing others to replace them and to replenish the supplies of sandwiches and cakes first of all let the water be bubbling boiling more than steaming hot let it sing its solo in the kettle then with teapot freshly scalded and shining happily let the tea be put in a teaspoon of tea for each cup to be served and always one for the pot pour the bubbling boiling water over the tea let it stand for a moment merely that it will then be sufficiently infused to give a delicate perfect cup of tea when more tea is required infuse more it is a simple process offer with the cup of tea as it is presented sugar and cream or if preferred lemon thinly sliced and sugar to suit the taste of the guest present the small cakes neatly arranged on plates the toast napkin covered on a tray and the sandwiches comfortably stacked on plates so proceeds a simple tea an expression of delightful hospitality the cup of tea now stir the fire and close the shutter fast let fall the curtains wheel the sofa round and when the bubbling and loud hissing urn throws up a steamy column and the cups that cheer but not inebriate wait on each so let us welcome peaceful evening in cowper when the weather is hot iced tea and coffee should come directly from the serving pantry and be supplied in tall glasses upon small glass plates to each guest at the time of serving the waitress also supplies a long-handled silver spoon tall glasses containing iced tea are decorated with slices of lemon these may be cut so they can be slipped over the rim of the glass garnishes of mint and lemon verbena are pleasant additions to the lemon after these have been served the waitress should supply each guest with soft sugar and cream if desired and she should be watchful to supply more cracked ice for the glasses if necessary tea and coffee 
filled cups of tea or coffee served with meals may come directly from the kitchen in which case the waitress offers to each guest after she has served the cup loaf sugar with silver tongs and cream and in the case of tea sliced lemon as well the hostess may serve from a tea wagon if desired coffee coffee which makes the politician wise and see through all things with his half-shut eyes pope rape of the lock end of section four end of the history of the art of table setting by claudia quigley murphy